So, um, what, so I think that this is our fifth call that we're doing. And the purpose of, um, as, as y'all know, is that we're starting off this Wisdom Wednesday series um, as an effort to experiment with different models um, to engage people to do recordings, interactives, and then we're going, we're starting to create a content library that we're going to start pushing out also to the larger public as we, as we accumulate um, our, our, um, our recordings. So super excited that um, Dina Baker is joining us today. Um, that um, because she's a mentor, she's one of our mentors and advisors in the Boston area. And when I first met Dina, I was super impressed um, by how she's one of those people who just gets it right away. And, uh, and, and also gave me a really nice compliment of how she appreciates how I use business language when speaking about nonprofits. So I was like, I think we're going to get along really well. So um, it's hello, Avital. Welcome, welcome. So I'm, uh, so the idea of this is that after week after week, as more people and different people join that it'll start to develop this online community so that also when we're doing in person gatherings, um, that we'll know each other and when we go to different cities. So what I'd love to do briefly is if, um, if we could each just go through and say what interested, say who we are, where we're calling from and what interested us in being on this call today. Bradley, yeah. Bradley if, if you could wait on that, I actually have a way I'd like to ask people oh, that. Yay, I love that. My presentation. Awesome, <laughs> so I'm gonna hand it over to you then. Okay. Uh, uh, so can people see my screen? Are you seeing me as presenter? Yeah. Hmm? Yes. You can see my slide? Okay, very good. Uh, so it's great to be here with you guys. Um, and I thought that we would indeed start with introductions. So first I'll very briefly introduce who I am uh, and then I'd like to find out who you are and as part of that, as Bradley said, why, why you're here. Uh, so first of all, the obligatory headshot. Um, I'm a communication and marketing professional for more than 35 years. Uh, I have expertise across all facets of the field, internal, external, marketing, communication, business strategy, financial communication, interpersonal communication, presentation, storytelling, the whole realm. So that's sort of a, a very small professional snapshot. Uh, then there's a photograph of me here at Machu Picchu, and uh, that's the adventurer side of me. Uh, I've had the privilege of exploring within my own culture and subcultures and across other cultures, and I believe that makes me a more effective communicator, community member, and professional. Uh, embedded in being Jewish and in the ethics of being Jewish is welcoming of the stranger, and to truly do so, we must seek to know others on their own terms and in their own places. Um, and then finally, you see a photograph of me, that, the, the synagogue photo. That's uh, a couple of years ago, me holding my then two-year-old grandson uh, in the front hallway of, of the synagogue. Uh, I am currently the vice president of my congregation. I'm the founding chair of the Social Justice Committee. I developed a large civil discourse project at my former synagogue in Philadelphia, where I previously lived, where I also served on the board, chaired the high school committee, led a massive strategic change process. My Jewish foundation ethically grounds me and it informs who I am in my family, in my community, in the world, and in my work. So that's what I bring to this discussion about both um, effective communication and um, being ethical. So next, I want to know who you are. And uh, what I'd like to ask you to do is to give your name. Uh, what brings you to this particular dialogue, a dialogue on effective communication and or the value we're discussing today of being ethical uh, in one sentence? What you do um, as a student, as a professional, where and what fields? And then um, one other thing you want us to know about you in this conversation in one sentence. So who wants to start? 
Don't all clamor. <laughs> yeah, so, all right, so name is Shahar. I'm leading a product management team in a tech company, uh, in a tech group, which is a large, in a part of a large organization, um, involved in the Jewish community in various ways from uh, volunteering or synagogue or um, other things that happen in the Boston area here. We had an interesting meeting last night actually with Governor Baker. Um, what else need to provide? So uh, why, you're, why, why do you choose to join a conversation specifically about effective communication and or being ethical? Which is what the topic is today. Ethical is a tough one. I'm the anti-ethical person. No, as um, it's always good to hear these. It's um, you never know what you're gonna learn and what you're gonna absorb and what you're gonna pick up to to do. So I like to always kind of listen and, and see. Well, what do I do right? What do I do wrong? And where can I steal some new skills? Okay. Who wants to go next? I can go next. Okay. I'm Avital and uh, I live in LA uh, with Bradley. And uh, um, what I do, I uh, do different things from selling real estate for over eight years to being a Southwest Regional Director for Masa Israel Journey helping young professionals from 18 to 30 uh, go to Israel for study abroad internship, volunteer opportunities. Um, I involved with Birthright and other Jewish nonprofit organizations. Um, why I'm here, um, I'm in sales and, you know, in presentations for many, many years. So I uh, would love to see what else I can add to everything I do. I do a lot of events. So I'm, I'm always in the field working with people and communicating 24 seven, considering that, you know, I'm on my own kind of schedule. So it doesn't matter when and where I'm always communicating with everyone. Um, mm -hmm. What else? Um, what will be valuable for people to know I'm a great resource? Okay. And who else do we have? Yeah. Oh, I'm hearing myself back. And, and then uh, Alan, welcome. I'm gonna, Alan, I'm gonna unmute you if that's okay. Hey, Alan. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Good, welcome. Welcome from Atlanta. Yeah, thank you. Glad I could uh, finally make it. I kept having conflicts on Wednesday, so um, glad I could jump in. Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Alan. Oh, go ahead. Your turn. Go ahead. So my name is Alan Pinstein. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I am, I guess, like a serial entrepreneur, uh, mostly in the software world. Um, and I've been doing that for about 25 years. Um, <clears throat> I really kind of enjoy starting things from scratch and building them up. Um, and there's you know, obviously a lot of marketing and communication and, and customer discovery and all types of conversation and presentation of of product and pricing, which I think is all touches on the ethics and the communication and everything. Um, and uh, last year I sold my company um, and I'm no longer working there. So I'm trying to figure out what to do with myself next. Um, and just uh, really interested in uh, kind of participating to share any insights I might have and, and learning as well. I think it's always, uh, no matter what you've done, there's always about 10,000 times more stuff you haven't. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate. Okay. Um, on the Jewish side, I'm an advisory member to the a local Chabad group here that runs a preschool and has a, a great building on the Beltline um, and does a lot of community outreach and help them with a lot of their strategic planning um, and uh, uh, things like that. So, yeah, that's, that's a good summary. Okay, great. Thank you. And it looks like we lost one person who was here earlier, but... Um, if she comes back, we can get we can hear from her then. Okay, so thank you all for that. Bradley, did you want to say anything about what interests you about 
communication or ethics? Yeah, I think I could always be more ethical and I think I could always be more communicative. So <laughs> excited to explore both with, uh, with y'all and thank you so much everyone for being here and thank you, Dina, for uh, enlightening us. Sure. So let's jump into it. Um, communication and ethics, if we think of them together. Uh, do you think of business communications do you, all of you think of business and communi business communication and ethics at linked or at odds? They link. Do you think I'm sorry, go ahead. I could see them as being at odds for each other at times. Okay. I would tell you were about to say something, I think, too. I am thinking that they link. Depends, of course, on the situation, but uh, mostly I think they link because you need to know how uh when you're communicating uh depends on the person to make sure that you are ethical in everything you do to okay. make sure that you get whatever results you want from that person okay okay alan or shahar do you have any thoughts on whether business communication and ethics are linked or at odds with each other i mean i, th I think both i think uh Certainly, they should be more on the link side, and I think sometimes uh, through expediency or high uh, expectations, people maybe sometimes take ethical shortcuts to achieve a goal. I think it's a choice. So that's where they're at odds. It's a choice. It's a, they are, they are independent. They're independent, but do you have a cho choice to to connect them or not. I don't think they are in odd or connected by any other given by the person that decide to communicate ethically or not. Okay, that's interesting. So it's a choice. So Bradley, you started by saying you think they can sometimes be at odds with each other. Uh, let's, let's start by talking about how they can be at odds with each other. Because if it is a choice, then pretty much everything is a choice, right? If it's a choice, uh, then one of the choices people sometimes make is to decouple communication from ethics, to say, in order to, uh, as I think Alan, you said, be expedient in reaching my goals with communication, I'm going to uh, not worry so much about the ethics. Why would that be? How would that be more expedient? Because that's actually, that's actually, Almost the opposite of what Avital said, which is that to communicate effectively, you really have to almost, you know, be genuine and authentic and ethical. It has to be there in order to get good results from, from your interactions with people. And well, I mean, I think so, on the simplest, I was going to say on the simplest form, um, sometimes if you give someone a full picture of everything, uh, it may slow down the decision making process, even though it might not change the eventual decision. Okay. Yeah, and I would add that like, I just, the thing, the company that keeps coming to mind is like Juul, right? So they're not communicating to the parents that their middle schoolers are, you know, taking in basically smoking cigarettes. Um, it's something that has completely been gotten rid of in order for Juul to like greatly increase their revenue. So they're withholding or not sharing critical information that's ethical in order to reach, in order to grow a company. And, mm -hmm. it's, just, and it's just wrong. And if, if they had, com if they communicated, like people just think that they're inhaling vapor, um, but they're not, they're inhaling carcinogens. It's right, which gets, which gets to the question of whether it's simply the communications that are unethical or whether it's the business model that's unethical and the communications are supporting that business model, which by definition makes them unethical. It's always so, easier and faster to say whatever the person want to hear. So uh, it's the truth in advertisement. No, you, you tell them what they want to hear and you don't have to think about it too much. You don't have to vet your claims. You don't have to do any research. You just speak whatever is the right thing at the right time to say. So Avital, could you respond to that? Because Shahar is saying that it's, it's most effective, and it, and that sounds like you're really talking almost about a sales situation to say to tell somebody what they want to hear because you're going to be more effective in in 
achieving your goal with them. But I'll be telling you, you said that you basically feel that being ethical in communication is more effective, and you work in sales every day. So, so okay. can you so how, respond to what Shahar says? Yeah, so how I feel, of course, you use in any way certain type of, like, sales technique, and, you know, you say certain things, whatever the person want to hear, but you still need to be inserting frame to make sure that you're not like crossing the boundaries. So it's like every day, you know, I know that I need, for example, I need to recruit people, right, to a certain program uh, or whatever, you sell in any type of product. Uh, when you're talking to a person, you for sure know what you, what's your goal is and what you're trying to achieve. But at the same time, you know that there is different ways how you can achieve. You can push and try to be a salesperson and try to sell them on whatever you need to sell. Or you can take a different approach of more of a personal, personal communication with getting to know a person, trust you and like you, and then making sure that they are buying from you. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there is different ways. Some people, like, for example, in real estate, I'm telling to everyone, like, people come to me in real estate because they know that I never push and, uh, you know, I'm a salesperson, but you will never see me trying to sell somebody on something, considering that in real estate, that's your goal because you're not getting paid until you will sell a property to someone. Right. So uh, you're on commission base. Uh, but but also what? Ultimately, ultimately, though, you can't build a client base if people can't trust you. Right, for sure. So for me, it's like, you know, I don't, you know, in certain situations, I'm convincing my clients not to buy a property. And if it would be a different real estate agent, they would say, oh, great, you know, I can make commission right now, 10 grand in my pocket. Oh, I'll sell her the property. But for mm -hmm. me, it's like, you know, I'll better, you know, my clients have been saying it's like, Wow, you know, it's a big deal that we know that you will tell us the inside information rather than somebody else will try to sell us on something. Because I know that today it's about them and tomorrow it will be about somebody else. And everybody have their own network of people. So sometimes this sale might not be the best scenario for you because you will sell that person, but then that person will find out some type of information that you were not trustful and not like ethical. And in the end of the day, that will ruin your reputation because he has the whole circle of people. Now, everybody sometimes forget that each person has a huge network of people. One person will say something about you, you're ruining your reputation. You know, like at a certain point, I had certain projects where organizations right. were coming to me and telling me, hey, we want you to recruit people for like Brandeis University in Boston or like right. in New York, Young Judea. And I was telling them, guys, I'm like, until I'll go to your location, see your program and making sure that your program is legit, I will never put my reputation. The money doesn't worth anything to me, even if I'll recruit somebody, you know what I'm saying? So it's all about like so making sure that you're not crossing the boundaries. Okay. So, so, and, and I think that, that sometimes where we look differently at interpersonal uh, situations where we're selling ourselves and we're doing it in a very interpersonal way and then business communications that feel more corporate. And there's might be some question of, of whether, whether that boundary changes. And I'll give you just a, a, a quick uh, example of a number of years ago when I headed uh, marketing communications in a firm that did work internationally and I was in a meeting with uh, the sales team and we were discussing the content of a new overview brochure and somebody said that they wanted a map that in the brochure that showed every place we did business nothing nothing very innovative but fine and they wanted it to include not only where we actually had clients, but any place we'd ever tried to sell business because theoretically we had done business there and that we had sent someone to that city or that country and we had therefore billed for time while there, you know, internally. We paid somebody for being there. And 
I stood up and said, without without thinking, I stood up and said, if that's really how you're going to proceed, I'm walking out and I'm never coming back. I've left the company because I can't cross that line. And ultimately, our clients would realize we'd cross, cross the line. None of this stuff is hidden forever. Think about you know, think of, think about all of the things we find out of eventually, about eventually, uh, in the banking industry, at Uber, everywhere. None of this stuff is secret forever, and we we can't cross that line. If we wouldn't cross it in our personal lives, we cannot cross it in the communication we do on behalf of our business. So, it, in my view, and so I want to move on to talk more explicitly about whether ethics has a place in communication. Um, has anybody ever heard of the International Association of Business Communicators? Okay, this is the global professional organization for people in the full range of communication fields. If you're interested in the communication field, you should be looking at um, IABC, particularly in this, in this um, realm, IABC publishes the Code of Ethics for, for Business Communication. Uh, it's through an associated organization, the Global Com Communication Certification Council, which is through the council through which I have my strategic communication management professional certification. Um, part of what they test on for certification is knowledge of the industry's code of ethics. So it is considered fundamental. And in fact, in, I was interviewed earlier today by the Ethics Committee for IABC about somebody who is an IABC member uh, and their questionable, with whom I've interacted and their questionable ethics behavior as a professional. It's taken quite seriously. Uh, and I want to link here so you can see what the code of ethics is in communicating for business. Because it is not enough to be good at communicating. You have to be ethical on it and to be honest, if you are really good as a communicator, you don't need to cross the ethical lines to be effective as a communicator. And that is what's most fundamental. When you want to talk about effective communication, if somebody needs to cross the ethical line, I would immediately question whether they are capable as a communicator. Because you can be effective, you can meet the organization's goals, you can meet your goals, whether it's interpersonal, whether it's in literature, whether it's digital and interactive, if you are fundamentally capable. And at that point, you, the ethics piece shouldn't be a question. But on the screen now is the code of ethics. There are 11 points to the code of ethics. So as a professional communicator, you have the potential to influence economies and affect lives, is what this tells us. And that power carries with it significant responsibility. IABC requires every member, and there are, I'm not sure how many members there are, but at the annual conference, there's about 12 to 13,000 people just at the conference. Um, so there's probably at least, I don't know, three times that in this organization. It requires its members to embrace these ethical guidelines in their work. That every, everyone who is a member of IABC must actually sign a statement as part of their application and renewal process that they have reviewed and understand the code of ethics. Uh, I want to particularly bring you to item number six on this list. I am sensitive to others' cultural values and beliefs. I mentioned that embedded in the ethics of being Jewish is welcoming the stranger and that to truly do so, we must seek to know others on their terms. It's also not only fundamental to being a good communicator because communication always starts with your audience. And um, Shahar, I, I think you may have said uh, that, you know, you, you tell the audience what they want. I would frame it differently. Great communication starts with understanding where your audience is, basically being able to be the spokesperson for that audience to the organization, to whomever is communicating, so that you can communicate in a manner that meets that audience where they, is, where they are but serves the needs of the organization in an ethical and honest way. No, I agree on that one. I'm just that uh, I, my point before was how I see the the 
the question that you ask. From communication perspective, right. the way I look at it, I, I am and the people that report to me, we are building ourselves as the trusted advisors. Mm -hmm. And we are those that the customer, our customers will want to come and communicate, ask questions and, and, and get their knowledge, regardless even if we have anything to sell, even if we do anything that they want, they know that we will help them. We will right. be that group that will help them figure it out, the knowledge. And then at the end, if we do have a product, sure, they're going to buy it from us. But sometimes right. not. Uh, but I agree that you have to be the trusted advisor. You have to be true to yourself and to, to what you do. But before I answer your questions, the way I saw it, which is the truth out there, is not as, as what we do. Right. No, I, I, I understand. I, I completely. Yeah. So, and as a trusted advisor in that role, in that consultative role, what's one of the most powerful things you can say to a client? No. The truth. What? The truth. No, and the truth. No. I said it many times. <laughs> if you want examples, I can give you an example. Sure. So, uh, again, I work for technology. We make products in uh, the customers is a one large very known pharmaceutical company and they struggle with our product for a while and got to the point that i had to join into a meeting in person at their facility and before they basically throw us out you know the old saying come pick up your stuff, it's waiting for you at the curb, you know? Yeah. So uh, I showed up and I was in the middle of that long conference table and everybody around, you know, people from our side on one side of the table, their side on the other side of the table. And they asked those questions. And when it came the time for me to answer, I told them, you're right, it doesn't work and we figure it out you were actually part of how we figure it out it's not something that we ship with it knowingly but the way you guys are actually using our software is above and beyond some of the um, application that we thought of mm -hmm. uh, knowing your problems we replicated it we're working on it i wish i could tell you here is a usb key upgrade your software it's fixed but it's not and uh, we're working mm -hmm. on it, it hoping to have it ready next week but we'll see and that was it now everybody on my side were like you can see the shock in their faces like what are you doing all the sales people and everything like what are you doing it's like and but you can see the person like their leader was sitting just across from me and he was the i don't remember he also had to travel to that facility i don't remember what was his direct like title and uh, but he was the head of um that technology department for that client and he looked at me and said huh you messed up my whole game i came here i'm gonna tell you there's a problem you're gonna tell me it's not a bug i'm gonna tell you you know it is and no you're gonna tell me that the engineering is working on it the problem is in our network it's in our computers it's everything about us and I'm going to tell you no. But you just said, you gave right. me the, the oh. fact in the face. I have nothing to do with that. Great, I'm glad we're going to have it next week. Let's go for lunch. And that one was of the most power, Right, because one of the most powerful things we can do when we're, when we're communicating with someone and particularly in, um, in a consultative situation is say, I don't know. Yeah. When we don't know, we say we don't know. Correct. Uh, it's it's giving giving up that need to always be an expert can be extraordinarily powerful. So, so I learned it actually in a different way. When I was young, uh, that's how I got to the U.S. I was younger. I wasn't young. I was younger. I would say it's about man tw over twenty years ago when I came here. Uh, it was an, again, Israeli company that relocated me. I was really the subject matter expert. That's why they relocated me to the New York office to help with um, um, 
establishing that office. I worked on Wall Street. We, we, we made software for the financial world. And I always provided answers to our customers because I really knew everything. I was always able to provide them the answers or the information they needed. And salespeople hated it. And they basically told me, you cannot always give an answer. If you always mm -hmm. give an answer, they're not going to trust you. There's nobody that can know that much. You always have to tell them, let me check. Let me think about it. Uh, I don't know. Let me go figure it out. And then two minutes later, just said, you know, I got the information. Here's the answer. Even if you're just holding yeah. it and then you give him the answer on the phone. People will well, trust I'm, you much I'm, better. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to say, I'm not sure I, I concur with that. I don't believe you should pretend you don't have the answer when you do. I, again, I believe I, I believe effective communication means honest communication. And, and so I think it's effective to say we don't want know when we truly don't and then to then go find the answer. If we have an answer, it's effective not to withhold it. But I, I want to, to move on now. I, I think we've had a good conversation about what might effective communication be, what might ethical conduct be, and how they might be in conflict or might support each other. And we've had some examples. Um, I want to really now leave it up to you to ask me to discuss whatever interests you. We sort of went in the direction of a lot of interpersonal and consultative conversation because I think um, this is the roles of a number of people on the call today. But um, I'm happy to answer questions about the full range of the issue of communication or ethics in businesses I've experienced it in the course of my business life. Um, careers in communication, ethics in communication, various types of communication, any other topic. I can talk about them in the context of all of these places, the corporate, nonprofit, government, consulting, personal life, civic life, Jewish life, um, and along a, a wide range of um, types of communication. What specific things do you guys want now to ask me about that, that I can help be um, informative on? Yeah, so I, have, I have a question. So, and something that I, I greatly admire about the way that you communicate is you're very direct. And so my difficulty is that I like beat around the bush instead of just going in for it because I want to be approachable and not, not, I don't know if approachable is the right word, but I want to be likable and don't want to put too much pressure on people and everything else. So then I end up sometimes rambling. So how do you find that balance between being incredibly direct, but not being seen as like aggressive and, um, and also being like considerate and thoughtful and not being seen as a pushover? Right. So, so first of all, we each have a certain natural inclination in how we communicate. My natural inclination is to be quite direct. So I need to make up for it on the other end. So for example, when I write an email, I sit down and I just start typing everything I want the person to hear. And then I go back and remember to write, Dear Bradley, at the top, <laughs> I hope you had a nice day. <laughs> and then I say, write something nice at the end. <laughs> and then I send it. Well, you probably start with the, hey, Dina, as I recall, the last time we spoke, you were going to go on vacation. I hope it was good. And a paragraph in, you start to get to the point. Yeah. And you probably need to go back and shorten that first paragraph to, the, to a sentence. So we each have our natural inclination. And part of it is just knowing what that is so we can go back and edit for it. That's a lot easier, though, in written communication than it is in spoken communication. In spoken communication, we don't really get that opportunity to edit. But you can still be self-aware. Uh, first of all, I always start from the audience first. And it is my belief that the audience, my, that the person I'm speaking with, writing to, whatever the form of communication is, is going to be happier if they get clear information as quickly as possible, because that's what they need. Obviously, that would be different in a Shiva home. I'm not talking about, you know, going in and, 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 and responding to someone's emotional needs, but on the assumption 
that our goal, this is a business situation and our goal is to provide people with information that they can act on or pass on to someone else or make a decision from. If you think about it from the point of view of, I want to help this person, which is really where you're coming from. You want to be likable. You want to be connected. I want to help this person. That can take you to, okay, then how can I give them the best information as succinctly and quickly and clearly as possible? You package that. You don't have to worry that you'll miss the part that gets you connected because that's your natural tendency. That will just be baked in. It will happen. So you just, it's always about folks, audience first. It's always about audience first. It's just, who's this audience? Where are they? What do they, what do they need? That's what I'm going to communicate. The rest is um, the rest is the package. And you never do more packaging than content. Cool. Thank you. Does that help? Tremendously. OK. Any other questions on any aspects of communication or, or ethics in business or comments? Have, have you found effective ways of framing uh, information such that when it's bad news that you deliver it well, or it's not great uh, news? Yeah, maybe saying no to people in a, a nice way, but at the same time where they still keeping it in an open yeah. um, I like that, Avita. Yeah. So, Again, I'll answer, I'll answer almost everything with audience first. It's going to be better for the person you're, you're saying no to if they get the message as quickly and clearly as possible. The nicest thing you can do is deliver it up front and then go back. Um, it, it, if you look at it from a journalistic perspective, if any, I don't know if any of you have any background in journalistic writing, but you start with your lead. Your lead is, is the nugget of information people need most. And that's where you start. So, for example, if um, you asked me if I, let's say you were to ask me if I could, uh, I don't know, ask me something I'm going to say no to. <laughs> uh, ask me if I can come out to LA and, uh, you know, tomorrow to go to a meeting that, that you want me to be at. I'm first going to say, I'm afraid I can't go. I have another obligation. I really appreciate that you asked me. Thank you for thinking of me. Generally, when I say no, I don't tell people any details on why. That sounds more like when you're giving bad news, if you give extraneous detail that, the, that they do not need, it sounds more like you're spinning. And when you spin, you offend people. You need to give them all the information they do need, enough that you that and enough that you're clearly being transparent. So if you're telling if you're if if you're announcing to a company, which I've had to do, that there's going to be layoffs. Say, starting next week, we're going to be laying off 300 people across the company. These are the financial reasons we're doing it. We wish we didn't have to. In the end, it is necessary for us to consider the health of the entire company and the broad uh, employee population. And unfortunately, this means that some people will no longer be able to work here. Now, you have to give them the context, the reason. If you start spinning, if you start getting so worried about how the bad news will be taken that you start cushioning it, it's going to sound like one, you don't really get how serious this is to me. And two, you're spinning or you're not being transparent. There's something you're hiding. You have to be really direct. Yeah, and from external communication, again, example is think about that everybody has something that, that or think about your life, your banks the post office, your insurance company, your credit card company, whatever company you work with, 
none are perfect. They all have something that you don't like about them. And it's mm -hmm. the same thing about our business. That there are, our customers don't like something about us and they don't like something about their competitors and everybody said they're gonna have it in the next version and some may have it in the next version and we will have it in the next version and whatever. But at the end of the day, if you communicate honestly and you provide that information uh, upfront, you build that trusted advisor um, uh, place where um, it's a company or it's a person that I would like to be able to continue to communicate with because be providing me a valuable information and they providing me information that I can use forward myself and I being now being trusted because I'm communicating something that is I, I have trust that it's uh, 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 that it is correct and honest communication, and you're creating this chain of people that can communicate. Uh, because at the end of the day, no, at the end of the day, no one is perfect, uh, and no one's going to judge you on your imperfection. They're going to judge you more on how you communicated it. So let me give you two examples from the point of view then of, of external communication. Since 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 you brought that up, Shahar and I had given you an internal communication example first. First of all, let's say you um, you do business with two banks. One of them sends you your statement and buried deep in that little, little print somewhere, it mentions that they're raising the interest rate uh, on your loan uh, or on, on your credit card. They can't really, read. so uh, let's say you have a credit card with two banks. Somewhere deep in small print, you get a piece of mail that, that buries the fact that your interest rate is being raised in your credit card. They have legally done what they're supposed to do. Let's say the other bank with which you have a credit card sends you a message that says, we want to be sure you're aware that effective on X date, your interest rate will go from 9% to 12%. We are doing this because of the following reasons. We really appreciate your business. So we want to make sure that you're fully aware of what to expect. Which company do you want to continue using as your credit card company? Because eventually you'll figure out that the other one raised the rates too. So that's example number one. Now let's look at marketing communication. That's, that's external um, business communication, but let's look at external marketing communication. When I think about, for example, how to uh, design a brochure or develop uh, a landing page, obviously I'm not going to give people, let people know everything there is to know behind a product. I have a very specific goal to inform them of certain benefits and capabilities that are important for them to make further inquiry. But I do want them to be able to follow a clear story so that they feel informed. So my formula is, if somebody were to read every headline, read the headline and every subhead on a piece, they would have the entire structure of the story and they would know enough to know whether it's worth them reading more. Because I'm telling you when I do that, that I respect you and I won't waste your time. On the other hand, I could put together a piece of marketing material that has a lot of flashy speak that's meant to grab you in a headline. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's also informative. But all it does is get you excited. It, it says something like, you know, here's something new and sexy. Doesn't really tell you anything. It's just meant to catch you with those, those phrases. And you have to read deep to find out whether it even matters to you. Which one are you going to say, this is a trustworthy company that I can do work with that cares about my time? You always start from the point of view of where is your audience and how do I respect the time they're giving me, whether I'm sitting across from them or I've never met them and never will. Which all goes back, I guess, Riley, to your question, which is to me the, the best way to remind yourself to be direct is to remind yourself that you care about the, the person on the other end of that communication. And that's where you're coming from when you're when you're couching things. So if you think of it that way, 
I think it can help you change it up pretty quickly. Any other topics people want to talk about? There's a lot in communication that's, and, and the ethics of communication that's very big these days. Civic communication, the communication in civic life is huge. Certainly, um, DNI communications, um, which is uh, uh, diversity and inclusion communications. There's a lot of very uh, hefty stuff going on in the communication world these days. Anything maybe you want to share with us from your experience? What will, will be valuable from you knowing our areas of expertise? Uh, well, your area, the, the areas in which you work, work are fairly diverse. And Tanya, you weren't on when we were introducing yourself. Could you quickly just let me know um, what you do where? So I make sure I meet your needs if you want to unmute yourself and let us know. Okay, she's still muted. Uh, so there's some diversity among what you do. I think that that um, the most important thing to me is that I think we should not distinguish too strongly between different modes of communication and different contexts of communication. In other words, the principles apply regardless, regardless of whether we're online, regardless of whether we're in person, regardless of whether we're in print, regardless of whether we're in our personal life, regardless of whether we are in our business life. I also think actually that when you, when you look at the way that, um, that the issues of community and business ethics are doled out in our scripture, in our, in our uh, literary tradition, you can see that they are intertwined and that we have to see them as one. There is never any moment when we're not communicating. There is business communication as a, as a practice, but there's never any moment in which we're not communicating except when we are completely alone and possibly only when we're completely asleep and then we're still probably communicating to ourselves. So, <laughs> um, If you think of every communication you have as an opportunity to model for others, it will be extraordinarily effective in, in helping you be effective as a communicator and ethical as a communicator. And, and I would say, no matter what, my motto, as I've said several times, is you start with your audience. Uh, you need to know who your audience is as early as possible and work your way back from what do they need, who are they, what is their profile, and how do we communicate. One thing we, one thing um, that I do a lot of is develop communication strategies. Those start with profiling who the communication audience is. I mean, we need to know the organization's object, uh, objectives, but then we say, objectives aside, who is this audience, what do they need? Then we develop messaging architectures, an entire architecture of messaging that responds to that audience. And then we go back and look at the strategies and tactics. I don't want to divide, define an audience for, a communica for, for communications based on my strategies and tactics. Then I'm going to shortchange the audience. I want to always look first at who the audience is. I want to develop messages that meet those audiences' needs, and then I develop the strategies and tactics that respond to those audiences and to which I can apply those messages. But I don't want to put constraints around them based upon my preconceived notions of what my strategies and tactics are. Anything else that I can that I can respond to? I think that I think this was really wonderful, Dina. I want to thank you for all of your time today, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, and yeah, yeah, exciting things. I thank all of you.
I hope you guys have a great rest of the day. And feel free to reach out if there's anything I can answer for you after the fact. And I'm definitely going to try that approach with my emails. I'm going to, I'm going to channel my inner Dina. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, all I can say works. That's uh, basically the style that I write. I, I, I just write whatever I want to say. And then I remember that I have to actually address it to you and say goodbye. <laughs> Very good. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thank Take you. Take care. Thank you.